Uh, hey everyone, Erin here, coming to you with a long overdue Q&A and uh, we're going to do a little uh, viewer mail postcard session at the end of this. Um, I did put up a, you know, ask me anything question in the community tab on YouTube before I did this. So I'll grab some questions from there, but a lot of the questions will also come from the videos that I haven't, uh, you know, answered questions. I'm trying to hit the questions that I'm seeing a lot of. Um, before we get into that, because there actually were some questions that came through the community tab question area uh, today, was that um, the day that I'm filming this, the USDA hardiness zone maps were updated. A lot of zones have changed. I don't think there's any surprises here. Well, maybe there's a few surprises, but I don't think any of us will be surprised to know that many of us have gone up a half a zone. I did talk to some people on Instagram. One person actually uh, went down a half a zone. She said they've been having um, really tough winters the past few years. So that would explain that. Um, I'll probably do more than likely a blog post, maybe a video about how how this affects people and what we should be doing about it. But I have to dig into the changes of the map a little bit more before we do it. Um, and a little bit more into, you know, there's, there's science, obviously, and how these maps are created. Um, I would just, well, first of all, I, according to the map, not according to my zip code, but according to the map, which is why you really need to uh, get in there and look at the map because zip codes can be very big and you might not all be the same zone. And that's what's happened for me. I've gone from a 5B to a 6A, but the area that that incorporates is the tiniest little sliver uh, right along Lake Michigan. So if I weren't as close to the lake as I am, I would probably still be a 5B. Like I said, we'll talk more about what you should think about this, what you should approach this as. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I was already I, I never felt great about buying a plant. If I, I shouldn't say this. If I wanted to be very careful about an expensive plant, I would usually aim for something that was zone four because I figured that gave me um, some buffer. So now that we're a six, you know, I'm certainly not going to run out and start buying a bunch of zone six plants. But the nurseries will start offering more of those. I mean, if your zone has changed, the nurseries are going to be, they've got a whole bunch of new plants to sell you now. So, you know, we'll talk a little bit about how to approach this. But uh, if you want to share in the comments what happened with your zones, if you're paying attention to that, uh, it's kind of an interesting thing. They, like I said, they do this every 10 years and uh, they sort of offer corrections and, and I don't think anybody is surprised that we're seeing all the zones generally shifting northward for the most part. So I did get some questions about that in the community tab. Forgive the machinery that you're hearing. Um, I ran home at lunch to film this because it is a beautiful day, but the construction guys are working next door, so that's what's happening there. Okay, Jamie Brotherton says, I just got a huge chip drop delivery. Chip drop is uh, this great service where arborists who grind up wood chips will dump off a load at your house. Um, can I place these fresh wood chips directly over my fallen leaves and old mulch? I think the big thing you have to be concerned of with, first of all, fresh arborist chips are the gold standard. They're the best, especially if they happen to be from like an evergreen because there's green bits mixed in there and that's just like all the good stuff in one place. You do want to be careful that you're not smothering things. I mean, one of the reasons why a great way to create a new garden area is to lay down about eight inches of arborist wood chips and then walk away for two years is because it smothers what's below it. So you do need to be cognizant about how many inches of mulch you're adding up there. Leaves, I would have no problem with putting it on top of. I certainly wouldn't go through the hassle of raking out my beds and then and then putting arborist chips on top i would just put them right on there but when we're talking about old mulch i think you want to be real careful about how thick that layer is getting i mean i think if you're mulching garden beds you know two to three inches is kind of kind of the max so i would just be a little bit careful about how much you're you're putting on there isabel asks i have some there's a box elder bug walking by. This is not a shock because they are everywhere this year. 
I have some Dahlia related questions. Was this a good Dahlia year for you? Which was your best performer and which Dahlia won't you be growing next year? It was an average Dahlia year for me. I had some that struggled a little bit. Uh, I would say particularly my large ones did not, did not really get going until quite late in the year which usually isn't the case. I mean, that's part of the reason why I start them earlier is to get them blooming a couple of weeks ahead of time. Uh, so I would say average wasn't terrible, but it wasn't fabulous. You know, some of the same really good performers that I always have were there. Um, Crichton Honey was, was fabulous this year. I grew one called Valley Porcupine, which I didn't even realize that was it until I dug it out and found the tag. Uh, that was a new one for me. And that was quite, at first I wasn't sure if I liked it because it was a really bright pink uh, but then as the fall went on it got really interesting kind of got sort of white in the center and then dark pink at the edges that one was was a really good performer that was very good and Milena Fleur was an excellent performer for me again this year even though I kind of stuck it in the middle of the bed so I didn't even really get in there that often to deadhead it um, there are several that I left behind this year in addition to the ones that I'm leaving behind and trying to overwinter so check out the Dahlia video if you didn't see that we're going to answer a question about that in a second Catherine says not a question but a request the banana needs its own channel and a website you could set up a camera in the basement and then it's space in the spring summer so we can see, keep an eye on it and watch it grow post footage on its website banana cam could be a huge hit Erin, how did you like the new self-watering light aqua pots? Did they work out for you this year? Are they something you would add more of to your garden? So I tried out two self-watering aqua pots. I believe they were 18 inch wide ones. I had them both out at the family cottage. And one of them I planted with sort of a mixed blend of plants. And the other one, uh, members of my family are love geraniums. So um, I put geraniums in that one for them the geraniums did amazing they're as good as they've ever looked out there the mixed container struggled just because i put some really big plants in there i put that new superbina pink cashmere in there and that is a huge one and that's like it, it was too big for that pot so because the plants were a little crowded it needed a lot of water um, it probably would have needed water every three days I'm not there to put water in those pots all the time, so I sort of rely on other people. Um, with the right plants in them, I would say that's a primo option. It was extremely easy to set up. You know, the reservoir, if, like I said, the only question is how long can you go with that without having to refill that reservoir? And as long as you don't have anything in there that's super packed in or super thirsty, I think you'd be fine. Like I said, those geraniums probably maybe filled that reservoir no more than once a week. They were fabulous. So I think those those light aqua pots are a game changer. They're very good looking pots. They're light so you can move them. Lots of good things with those. And yes, I would absolutely add more of those. Amy says, we just finished a new deck this fall and I would like to try and grow roses and an ornamental tree in pots next season. We are zone 4B. Will we be able to overwinter them outside in their pots or do you think it will be too cold? The general rule for any sort of shrub, and I would count your, or tree, um, I guess, or perennial too, um, is that you, sh that grows in a container, is that it should be two zones hardier than the zone you're growing in. Uh, that's just because those roots are so much more exposed. So that's a general, that's a general rule of thumb, and that doesn't mean that's the rule rule. So you can definitely give it a shot. Now for the ornamental tree, if you're thinking a small ornamental tree, you guys probably know that you've seen me keep shrubs and trees in pots in my unheated garage over winter. So if it's a situation where you could move those pots into a protected area, like an unheated garage, don't do a heated garage, um, or a very protected area, um, and you can even build up like a little barrier around them, you could do straw bales, stuff it with leaves, um, if you can move those pots, I think you have a lot more options. If you're going to leave those plants sitting out on your deck all winter, I would, I would say you got to be very careful. And for a zone 4B, which is probably now a 5A, I would at least get something that's zone 3 hardy. So Nicole says, this is about dahlias, 
I've learned over the last couple of years that my dahlias in the in the ground in my zone 8A garden come back, but my dahlias in pots do not. Do I have to dig them out of the pots to store them, or can I just cut them back and throw the whole pot in the garage for the winter? Then, uh, and then this is Nicole, and she says, give Dorothy scratches for me. That's very sweet. Uh, you should be able to move that whole pot uh, somewhere. That's a perfectly fine way to do that. I've done that before. The thing is, you just don't want that soil to be super wet going into storage. That's the only thing. And then you do have to make sure it doesn't dry out fully completely, but I'd be less worried about that in soil than uh, you know in something else. So that's absolutely a good way to do that. Do you use anything on your teak container to preserve the wood? No, we have not treated our teak planters at all. You know, Tyler, 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 Tyler <laughs> says, are there any annuals or perennials that you've had good track record with against deer? Um, and there's a long list of things that he's found, he or she has found that the deer have eaten and a list of things they haven't eaten. Oh, well they've eaten around them and scraped everything around them but not eaten these plants. So my general rule, I'm not gonna get into like naming a whole bunch of plants, but uh, anything with a strong scent is especially with a foliage that has scent is usually quite deer proof so um, they are in uh, this is texas zone 9a so that's a little bit different which is probably it's helpful to look for plant characteristics rather than specific plants um, anything with a, a like a scented foliage tends to keep animals away so for me that's something like boxwood anything you know like mint like animals will not eat mint i'm not saying grow mint but these are examples of scented foliage plants anything with a fuzzy leaf generally they stay away from around here that's stackies uh byzantania lamb's ear pulmonaria things like that that have kind of a fuzzy leaf they tend to stay away from those too another deer question here from amy uh last year Deer ate every bit of foliage from my Densiformis U, so I created a chicken wire cloche over it. Is there a spray you recommend for the others that are too large to cover? Um, bigger problem since they lost their dog. So, yeah, I like the cloche, the sort of chicken wire cloche. That's a great idea. Uh, the other thing you could do, depending on where it is, is you could build a structure out from it. So I have done this in the past where I put down like really tall bamboo poles, and then I will actually just take nylon string and tie string around it every, you know, whatever, 10, 12 inches. And they don't, they can't see very well. This is my understanding. They can't see very well, so they run into that string and it kind of freaks them out. So if you're able to build a structure out from it, uh, in a place where that wouldn't matter, that is a good option. In terms of sprays, I do deer spray all year long. Um, you know, plant skid, I think is, I think plant skid is a very good recommendation. I still use uh, Messina's Deer Stopper too, but I feel like that is less effective in winter than maybe some of the stinky ones. I mean, I grow, I use that one because it's not stinky. I think maybe the stinkier ones are better for winter. And then the other thing that I've started playing around with because it was recommended to me by a couple of professional landscapers is deer scram, which is a pelleted, it's a pelleted form. And it lasts for a pretty long time and you can, it's important for me, you can put it on top of snow. And so it's something you apply to the area around a plant. Uh, I have been playing around with that on the new area between us and the neighbors and I feel like it I feel like it's working. So uh, those are some to try. You might want to try a mixture of those. Uh, do the deer scram plus one that you actually spray on. Uh, here's another question. When I find mushrooms in my garden, should I pull them out or are they beneficial? I never know what to do. Mushrooms are um, usually a sign that there's good fungal activity going on. Uh, if they are, if they, I mean, I don't think they, I guess, I guess if you left them, they would break down and then provide some more organic matter, but we're talking small bits here. So you can leave them. I think that's just fine. They're not gonna hurt anything. Or you can, you know, knock them over if you're worried about, you know, if, if you don't know what kind of mushrooms they are and you're worried about a pet getting into them or you just think that they're unattractive, you can scrape them off and, and put them in the compost pile or whatever, that's fine too. I usually, if I see them and they're like in the middle of my lawn, I'll just take my foot and sort of knock them over and they shrivel up in like a matter, in a matter of days, but they won't hurt anything. 
Beth says they moved into an area and discovered that the soil is really a challenge. It's two inches of sandy topsoil, tons of rocks of all sizes, and then hard compact clay below. They can hardly dig a hole with a shovel. Uh, rec she's looking for recommendations for improving the soil so they can plant with ease. Compost, compost, compost will heal, heal a lot of things. Chopped up leaves will help that. It is, again, it's a process. It won't fix it right away, but um, or wood chips, uh, use those arborist wood chips we were talking about before. Uh, those will break down, you know, actually, I feel like they break down in about six months, honestly. They break down, but certainly a year they'll break down. That adds, what you're looking for is adding more organic matter because you've really got the worst of all worlds there because the sandy topsoil is no good. The clay is hard to deal with, and then you've got those rocks. You're not obviously going to be able to get rid of the rocks, um, so you'll just have to deal with those over the years and start making some rock piles to dig them up. But in terms of managing that clay soil and that sandy soil, organic material is always your friend. Compost, leaves, arborist chips. So another question, this is about dahlias, and this question is, um, this is a person who does not have to dig their dahlias. They overwinter in the ground, and um, she wants to know, how often you split them, how you deal with that. So, pro I mean, there are people who never split their dahlias, who keep them in the ground forever, but they, like any perennial that's overcrowded, they will decline. So it's very much like if you've ever had like irises and they turn into this big patch, but they just don't bloom that well. Same concept, very similar concept, because it's the same, same sort of function in terms of rhizomes versus tubers, etc. My thought is, I mean, you can, you can kind of wait to see when they start declining and then do it. Probably, I would say every three, third year, you should probably dig them up and divide them. That would be, that sort of would be my guess on it. And uh, you dig those up in, you know, pretty much early, well, not early, not super early, but in the first part of spring. Uh, divide them and then let them cure a little bit. Like let those cuts that you've made harden off uh, in a protected area for at least a few days. It all depends on humidity and temperature and all that stuff. And then replant from there. But you don't want to put them in, you don't want to put them back in the ground right away with fresh cuts on them. So since we're kind of talking about dahlias anyway, let's move on to the overwintering dahlia video I did. As I mentioned in that video, I've done these videos before, but there's and I've been dealing with my dahlias the same way for many years with the one little twist that I mentioned in that video. But um, I always feel like some people are looking for a new take on it. Maybe I make videos better than I did the first time I covered it. So sometimes I cover these subjects, you know, multiple times. In that video, I talk about how I'm experimenting this year by leaving many of the tall growing dahlias that I grow along the south side of the house in the skinny little bed leaving them in the ground and gonna mulch them heavily. I've only mulched them with leaves so far. I probably will putting, be putting arborist chips on top of them. Um, I could maybe put a frost blanket, you know, if I felt so inclined. I don't know that I do necessarily, especially given that I've had two dahlias over winter in that spot that have just been forgotten about and not even mulched the past few years. Several people said, aren't you worried about overwintering thrips or bad bugs? Because they've seen Laura from Garden Answer uh, talk about the problems that she's had with thrips uh, when she tried to overwinter her dahlias last year. Now, Laura is, I think, a zone six. She's a zone six something. I'm not sure which. But she did have really good success overwintering her dahlias in the ground last year in terms of them surviving. However, she had a bad th thrip problem. And she was sort of thinking that that, I'm basing this not on something she told me about from her videos. Um, she was thinking that perhaps that thrip problem was perpetuated by overwintering that plant material in the ground. So, a um, couple of things. First of all, um, I will just say this. Thrips are, have very specific needs. Thrips love hot and dry. Laura lives in high desert. It is hot and dry there. That's why Laura has to run irrigation all over her garden. That is not my situation here. I'm not really that hot. Um, and it has been dry. That is an issue. But uh, I don't think it's the kind of the 
it's not the kind of dry that someone in high desert situation deals with. So thrips have not, I mean, I'm knocking on wood, knocking on wood here big time. Thrips have not been a big problem for me. I did deal with them maybe four years ago, five years ago, something. I had a small area of dahlias that had thrips really bad. And that was before I added in uh, drip irrigation tubing in the skinny bed uh, on the south side of the garden where I'm actually overwintering the dahlias this year. Ever since I did that and was able to have more consistent watering, I've not had a problem. Thrips are a pain in the butt. I'm not saying I can't get them. I'm not saying I won't get them again. I'm just saying I didn't notice any this year and I'm not concerned about overwintering them. In addition to that, I think that Laura and I um, probably have a little bit different viewpoint about overwintering overwintering you know how to overwinter plants and good bugs versus bad bugs and all that stuff and um i'm back sorry about that this we are at that part of the year where i am chasing daylight and i'm not ready to bring you guys down into the basement to make videos yet because it's so depressing because it's still pretty nice out it's just that there's not a lot of light okay a few more questions i want to get to here and this is not by any means meant to say one of us is right and one of us is wrong. It's just to say that we have different approaches on this. And my thought on leaving plant material in the garden over winter is that good bugs and bad bugs go hand in hand. You need to have bad bugs for good bugs to have food. So this is a change that I made in my garden. I don't know, gosh, it's eight years, a decade ago. I don't know where I stopped worrying every time I saw a bad bug and waited a little bit. And by building this ecosystem, and I feel like I have created a fairly good, I'm sure there's always more I can do, I know that, but I feel like I've created a pretty good ecosystem here. So I'm more concerned about giving those good bugs a better chance at overwintering and making this hospitable for them. And yes, when you, you will overwinter some bad bugs in there. And as far as I'm concerned, that's just more food for those good bugs when they wake up. So a lot of people, so a lot of people asked about that. I'm aware that Laura had some issues with it. It is not a concern that I personally have here. Okay, I'm gonna pause, come back at another time on this video with more questions and postcards. I'm back. Sorry about that. This We are at that part of the year where I am chasing daylight and I'm not ready to bring you guys down into the basement to make videos yet because it's so depressing because it's still pretty nice out. It's just that there's not a lot of light. Okay, a few more questions I want to get to here. So Neri says, I am zone 5B. When is the right time to put down compost and mulch, fall or spring? You can do either. Um, I think, you know, one of the nice things about doing it in fall is that it does suppress those weeds that come up very early in the year. It's also kind of a thing sort of checked off the list. It also sort of starts the process of getting that organic material worked into the soil as it rains or as, you know, late season insects are moving around in there. So. I think fall's a really good time to do it, but you could absolutely do it in spring too. You just gotta make sure you're not covering up the crowns of plants. Joni says, do you light up your landscape for Christmas? We don't do like a huge light thing, but Christmas winter containers are some of my absolute favorite containers to make every year. So I absolutely do those. I've actually already got branches this year. I'm a little bit more on top of it than I normally am because I was so disappointed with not being able to do any proper fall containers that I'm quite excited about doing some Christmas stuff. And then we do a little bit of garland and we you know, light up one tree and specifically and that's about it. Sarah asks, we are completely renovating our backyard. All the garden beds are empty while we finish up the landscaping. Are there any super vigorous annuals we would recommend to fill up these beds with next season? We plan to plant the real beds in fall of 2024, spring of 2025. She's in zone 5A in the Twin Cities. Um, think about vines, annual vines, you just and then just let them ramble. Um, so um, things like uh, purple hyacinth bean is a great one. Thumbergia will go everywhere. Uh, sweet potato vine obviously can fill in really nicely. Don't forget things like zinnias that are very easy to direct sow. You can just sow them right out there and they'll pop up. Um, 
trying to think of some other things, but definitely the vines, because those will also serve as a ground cover for you and prevent a lot of weeds from coming up, at least later in the season. They do take a little bit um, to get going, but once you get them going, they will, they will cover everything. So um, that would be the off the top of my head recommendations. Uh, on the dahlia video, someone asked, Christine asked, could you have used bag shredded mulch in place of the leaves to cover the dahlias that I left along the front of the house? 100%. It doesn't matter what you insulate these things with, uh, as long as it's something well, typically organic, um, any of that would have been fine. On the banana video, uh, where I once again dug up the banana, we had a couple of questions. Will you be potting the banana, put, planting the banana in the ground or in a pot next year? I don't. No, because I actually really enjoyed that banana in the ground this year. It was really, I liked it in that spot actually a lot. It was quite cool. But I do think that the year that I put it in that container at the front was the best that container has ever looked. So I might go back to, maybe I'll just get another one. You know, I could do that. Um, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm quite inclined to revisit that to that giant front container again. Uh, Cause that was just, that was good. That was really something that, that I really liked. I got some other ideas too, that I might want to do in there. So we'll see. So then on the compost video, this is the video in which I basically said, I do everything wrong with compost and yet compost still happens and sort of encouraging people to not worry about it too much and just get some compost going. There were a lot of questions about the compostable pots uh, made by proven winners that I put into there. Somebody had made the comment that there was that those pots are not going to break down uh, in a home compost situation and they're going to be in there forever yada yada yada. Uh, well I did talk about this in the video about you know um, home compost this was this is why this is an experiment because yes these things will break down in industrial composting facilities are very hot piles that are turned frequently. That is not how most people's home compost is. So the experiment here is to see what happens with these when you add them to just very average compost piles. Another person said they will definitely be there, you know, next spring or next fall when you go in there. Absolutely. I have no expectation that those are going to break down in a year. That doesn't mean they don't compost. Um, there's a lot of things in compost that takes over a year to in a home compost pile to break down. But I'm going to report back to you and let you guys know how it works out so that we can see whether as these types of pots get more popular in the market, which I hope and believe they will, like is it really practical to stick those in your compost pile or do you still need to find a place to take those to? It's day three. This video was supposed to take like a little bit to film and because of time and light constraints, I'm on my third day, third outfit, third sort of location. I apologize for the half sun situation here, but um, I can't stand it like in my face. Okay, we have to catch up on some postcards. If you are new here and you don't know what the heck I'm talking about here um, for, gosh, how long has it been you guys? several months, eight months maybe? I think we started this in spring last year. I have been inviting people to send me postcards, um, letting me know about gardens that they saw that inspired them in some way. And then I'm sharing with everyone so we can all share the inspiration because that is the best part about finding something new in a garden is sharing it with fellow gardeners. So I do have a little bit to, to catch up on here. A couple of these might be very old because they went to a different address uh, and then they took a while for them to actually make it to my house. Okay, so here we go. Oh, hang on. I hope you guys can see that. Yeah, you should be able to see the cards. Okay. All right. This is uh, from Andrew. Andrew. Um, this is a little bit of fall from Southern California. And this is fall in the Temecula wine country. Um, those are um, vineyards that have beautiful fall color. And I don't know why I never thought about that, but I bet you the vineyards are absolutely gorgeous in fall. I have been to them before. I've been to Napa before, but uh, it was... Actually, it was in September, I want to say. So I don't think there was color then. Medicino? Is it Medicino or Medicino? It's got to be Medicino. Uh, botanical is a must-see garden. The garden walk takes you 
to the coast. Absolutely beautiful. Hope you get a chance to visit here. This is from Teresa. She has some recommendations. I always love this when people add these things so that if you're going there, you've already got the recommendations and hope I can use them too. Little River Inn, excellent bar, dining and views. The Glass House is unique glass art. Patterson's Pub, great food, excellent service and great beverages. Here is a postcard from the Medicino. Got it. You guys, is it even postcards if I'm not pronouncing something wrong? You will correct me and I appreciate that. Coast Botanical Gardens. This is Fort Bragg, California. Um, that is a beautiful little picture. I think that's a heather growing there, which is one of the things that I can't grow because we do not have acidic soil here. And then she sent the brochure, which I always sort of love these because I love looking at maps and looking at brochures. Um, really beautiful. They've got a little what's in bloom section here. Anyway, there's another recommendation. Thank you for sharing that. That is fabulous. Oh, this is from the Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh. The selection of postcards at the gift shop was not great, but I selected what I thought was the best one. As I was walking around the garden, I felt inspired to try, di try different things. I thought of you and how you say that we just have to try different things in our garden. It's okay if my garden doesn't look like the garden in Edinburgh. My garden is uniquely mine. Oh, Yes, this is from Michelle. Yes, 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 a million times, Michelle. I love your videos and your content. Thank you for continuing to inspire me. That was very sweet of you. So that's Michelle, and this is the Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh. Beautiful, thank you. And, I mean, you guys know I talk about the stamps all the time. Good stamps on there. There's seeds coming up here. I can tell. Greetings, Aaron. Is it true that you don't like growing hibiscus? Enclosed are pink hibiscus seeds. They are hardy even for zone three. Correct us if we're wrong, but we believe it is commonly known as swamp hibiscus or swamp rose mallow. The seeds can be stratified, sanding, uh, sanding the outer skin and freezing for a few days before planting. But every year we throw seeds in the same part in the same part sun area where the mature plants have been for many years now. Hope this is an alternative to the dinner plate varieties. Depending on how winter is, we are a zone three to zone four gardeners that enjoy your videos and Instagram accounts. Keep us posted on your progress. Um, this is from Sisters Ellen M. And they have an Instagram account and it's Lynn Voss Canvas. L-I-N-V-I-S, C-A-N-V-A-S. Thank you so much. How nice that you I love it when family members do this and beautiful little um, beautiful little seeds in there thank you so much you two I appreciate that Kingsbury horticultural garden is a feast for the senses with walking past winding through more than 2,500 different varieties of flowers shrubs and trees the stunning designs and color combinations with all the hydrangeas had me awestruck and feeling it's awestruck I'm feeling inspired to make my garden super saturated with flowers that I love Erin your wit and wisdom is the best cheers Patricia and she is from Maine and uh, Kingsbury Horticultural Garden is a 27 acre public garden located in the heart of St. Andrews New Brunswick Canada looks absolutely beautiful thank you there are great gardens in Canada and I've not been to a single one so that should change Greetings from Ireland. My mom and I are here together on a garden tour hosted by Garden Gate Magazine. We spent the last 10 days visiting two to three gardens each day and have seen some amazing places in the National Botanic Gardens, Mount Usher and the Blarney Castle Gardens. But the best part has been visiting some pretty spectacular private gardens. This card is from June Blake's garden and we also had the opportunity to see her brother Jim's garden as well. Both gardens are amazing and getting to meet both Jimmy, I think it's Jimmy, and June made the experience even more special. They are so knowledgeable down to earth. Overall, it's been an amazing trip seeing a wide variety of plants and gardening styles. All the best, Rachel Buss and Dean Carpenter, Deanne Carpenter. Um, that is beautiful. And I will say that the best thing about organized garden tours and garden events is the opportunity to see private gardens. Um, often I feel like gardens beget gardens and that's why when I went to Philadelphia, which is home to so many wonderful public gardens, the private gardens are there that are there are absolutely stunning too and it, it's so nice when people will invite you into their gardens so that sounds like a fabulous trip Erin while traveling with work I came across this lovely arboretum and herpetarium and I thought you enjoy I thought you enjoy it even if you're never able, able to visit this is from Chad in Louisiana and this is oh my gosh it's from so I didn't even notice it was from Saudi Arabia look at that that is wild 
Very cool. Chad, thank you for sending that. That is definitely the first postcard from Saudi Arabia. Dear Aaron, hello from Sydney, Australia. Last year I moved house, so now I live five minutes from the native plant botanic gardens. So I have to come here to appreciate our indigenous plants more than I used to. So have come to appreciate our indigenous plants more than I used to. Early each spring, there's a wonderful display of paper daisies. They make my eyes happy. Love your channel. Take care, Sonia. And I think she's on Instagram at sleepy song um, underscore au. This is so beautiful. Look at that. This I have to say that if I was thinking about indigenous plants of Australia, this is not what I would picture. I guess I always think outback. I have been to Australia, by the way. I've been to the the Sydney gardens. That was before I was super into gardening, but it, I remember loving it very much. Hi, Erin. Love your channel, and I've learned so much from you. Thank you. Here is a postcard of Munsinger Clemens Gardens in St. Cloud, Minnesota. It has over 20 acres of gardens and features many styles, including a gorgeous formal garden and gardens that run along the banks of the Mississippi River. You're not too far from it. Have you been there? Thank you for all the wisdom and inspiration you share. This is from Jen. No, I have not, but it is absolutely it's beautiful. Gorgeous. Look at those paths. Thank you for sending that. Spring has sprung on this side of the world. This is another one from Australia. We got lots of Australian ones today. I love this. Visiting friends and family had the opportunity to visit both the Tasmanian and Melbourne Botanic Gardens. A must, a must if you're ever on this side of the world. And this is from Carla. Thank you so much. Oh, it looks like it's one out of two. So there's another one coming. And here it is right here. I love, I love all the flowers. Long time viewer. Oh, thank you, Carla. So beautiful. This is the Tasmanian Gardens. I need to go to Tasmania. That would be fabulous. And I've never been to Melbourne. I've only ever been to Sydney. My uh, Mr. Much More Patient um, spent some time in Australia. He lived down there for a couple months in Perth. I call this my bee garden. Wildflowers intended to attract bees, but many butterflies too. So pollinator garden is probably more accurate. This is from Chris in... Uh, Vunzend, Sweden. P.S. My sister describes my gardening style as mad scientist. I prefer experimental. Very beautiful. Uh, this got all damaged in the, in the mail, but look at this side of the picture right here. Uh, and this is from Sweden with excellent, excellent Swedish stamps on it. Hello, Erin. In June, my friend uh, Mary and I visited Winther's Winters, Shanna Claire, Mount Cuba, and Longwood Gardens. What a fabulous, inspiring, and fun trip. Both of us learn a lot from you and enjoy your channel. Thanks. This is Warm Riches from Mary Helen in uh, Kansas City and Shaughnessy in Columbus, Ohio. Very beautiful. I did not get to Winterthur when I was there. One wonders why. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing. And yes, that is always such a good thing. <laughs> got some financial mail got mixed in here. Hi, Erin. When you were in Philadelphia in the rain, I traveled to sunny Scotland. Like most of like most UK gardens, even in late September, were spectacular. It is amazing what wind, moderate temperatures, and sea air do to flowering plants. They seem to love it, and so did I. I picked up the UK Yellow Book when I was there, and I'm making plans for more visits. This is Anne, and she's from outside Philadelphia. You know, that is true, that sea air. You know, you look at latitudes, and... You know, you think, oh, we're probably in a similar gardening area than them, but they get those the sea air and the currents um, from the ocean, and it changes the whole picture there, and it is so beautiful. This is back from August, by the way. My apologies that it took so long to get this one into a video. This is from Dorothy, and she sends pictures of bananas. I enjoy your channel very much. I used to live in your zone five. Uh, southwest Lower Michigan in the snow belt. Now I'm in zone 7B8A since 2007. Our new house had zero landscaping and the backyard is 25 feet below grade. There was no access it, and it took on water from three yards like a floodplain. That sounds like a nightmare. Six years ago I considered it complete but a garden is never is is never really done. I started this January and put in two more drains and another fountain. Cheers Dorothy. 
P.S. I think it'd be fun to have your viewers send in pictures of their banana plants. We've talked about that. And here are some. So this is Musa. This is Musa Baju. This is the hardy banana, um, which will technically hardy down to zone four. I've had a couple of people recommend this one to me, and I certainly saw plenty of these in Philadelphia. Um, actually, Heather at Here She Grows grows one. She's in the same zone as me, just she's down near Chicago. And um, they're beautiful plants. They're a little different from the red Abyssinian that I grow um, in terms of color. And of course you have to pick a spot where you want them forever, which is really like the main reason why I'm not interested in trying it. You do have to protect them quite a bit in our zone, regardless of what they say it is. They do make bananas, but it's not edible. So um, not that it matters. It'd be, I don't care if they're edible. They probably taste like garbage anyway, because the bananas that we're used to eating are a very highly cultivated variety. But beautiful, beautiful banana. And I do love, if you guys have ever seen, I don't know if you can see it on here, if you've ever seen like how bananas grow, it's fascinating. And I, I mean, I would be thrilled to grow a banana. I don't care if I can eat it or not. Anyway, thank you so much, Dorothy. My apologies for not being able to read that one sooner. Dear Aaron, thank you for sharing your knowledge, enthusiasm, and design sense. I would like to tell you about a garden that is located in my town and truly inspires me called Deep Cut Gardens in Middletown, New Jersey, about an hour south of New York City. It's part of our parks, county park system and open all year round. The gardens were originally owned by Vito Genovese. Yes, that Genovese. As you can see in the enclosed brochure, the park offers a rose parterre, shade garden, Japanese-themed garden, display greenhouse, bonsai display, display garden, and a home composting demonstration site. My favorite is the display garden. I love to walk through the arbor made from tree limbs and plant it with bean vines to see what they have planted, how they are doing, etc. Not only does it offer beautiful gardens, but tons of activities too. I have taken classes in floral arrangement, composting, winter sewing, and native plants. They offer guided, guided tours as well. And when I one in early spring and the park ranger point out trees early spring bulbs and edible plants it's always interesting to see the shapes of trees and shrubs without leaves in spring the walkways and rose parterre are filled with tulips it's gorgeous thank you for your videos and the opportunity to share my appreciation for deep cut gardens with you this is from diane and um this is quite a place another i mean this is just it right there are gardens all around us that we don't realize are there and what a treat it is especially with a garden that runs uh, multiple program like a lot of great programming um, how wonderful would that be very nice thank you so much for sharing that add that to your list everyone deep cut gardens in middletown new jersey all right after a lot of tries we are done with this video i hope you guys enjoyed i think everyone really loves the postcards um so Feel free to keep sending uh, if you stack some some great inspiration up over the spring. Uh, the Impatient Gardener, P.O. Box 99, Belgium, Wisconsin, 53004. The address is always in the zip code if you don't want to write that to always in the zip code. The address is always in the description, which is not the zip code, in case you ever want to find that. And as you watch this, just know uh, I've been trying to pay a little bit more attention to the blog lately, which I used to do daily back in the day. It's been a long time since I've done that. But um, I am starting to put gift guides up there and I've got a special video coming up, collaborative video with some gardeners that I think you're not going to want to miss. That's coming up probably about a week from when you see this one. And I have also done a post that talks a little bit about how we should be approaching this whole new zone situation and more information about what the zone map is meant to do uh, and what it means. You might find it interesting if you're into that. All right, thank you for watching. Thank you so much for sending this mail and helping to inspire other garden gardeners. Uh, I love it so much. Um, and I hope you guys too. All right, we'll talk soon. Thanks for watching.